Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today, I would like to tell you about the group structure on characters or kind of the dual group. We will see what that actually means, like a dual vector space, a dual group. And this will play a role in the next video, which is about Fourier analysis on groups, which is kind of a fun topic with a lot of applications. Um, the applications are a little bit too much uh, for me to explain in this series on representation theory, but Fourier analysis on finite groups, there are whole books on them. Uh, but that's next video anyway, I'm starting waffling. So let's have a look at the dual group for today. Uh, so here comes the idea, or at least how I would like to understand the idea. So dual vector spaces, what is a dual vector space? Maybe the most uh, well-known concept of duality in mathematics. Duality is kind of everywhere, but maybe the dual vector space is the most common one. I like to illustrate it as follows. So I take a vector. I don't worry too much about the details of the vector, but I plotted it using Mathematica. The vector points a little bit like in this direction here. And there's a kind of the, uh, it's a normal vector to a certain plane, hyperplane here, the blue one. Uh, yeah, that's a vector. A vector is a vector. It's an element of a vector space. The dual to, of a vector is a form. That's a map from the vector space to, well, let's say the complex numbers. And it just is pairing with the, your, your favorite vector. And pairing with your favorite vector looks uh, kind of like kind of um, slicing through the uh, normal hyperplanes here. So pairing zero is the defining hyperplane, pairing one is the next one, pairing two and so on, at least in my picture. So uh, a pairing is actually kind of like a dual, dual picture in the sense that you kind of transpose the vector. You can also think of this as being a transposed vector. In this case, it's one of the two zero, uh, one over two, because, well, you can multiply a transpose vector by your favorite question mark vector and you get a number. So a dual vector space is nothing else in the vector space of, well, <laughs> normals to your given vector of forms on the vector space. Okay, so here's kind of the same picture for a different vector and really works the same. So the vector points roughly like that and the uh, form itself can be more like thought of kind of like slicing through the normal uh, planes for that vector. Okay, so it's just a map if you want from your vector space to Z, uh, to the to Z, yep. if you want to Z, but let's go to the complex numbers. Let's not work with Z modules, let's work over complex vector spaces. And as we have learned in the previous videos, um, we also have maps that end in, in the complex numbers and they start from groups and they're called characters. So maybe the correct definition here, whatever correct means of a dual group should be like the group of characters, right? So um, that's a question mark for now. Kind of you would like to define it as all the maps from G to C and there should be a natural group structure on it and you would like to call it the dual group. And for everything reasonably finite, like for finite dimensional vector spaces, it should be equivalent. So everything should be equivalent to its dual. Like a finite dimensional vector space is equivalent to its dual, it's isomorphic to its dual, it's just a really different perspective, like um, either taking the, those vectors or thinking about forms. Kind of the same should happen for dual groups. Uh, before we get there, let me just uh, theorem characterize the characters of cyclic groups and then the characters of abelian groups in general. Um, so by now, I hope you're reasonably familiar with this code here, which, well, you can also find in the description. And the code just says that you can uh, so you can run it, run it in magma and it will spit out the character table. In this case, abelian group seven is nothing else than Z mod seven Z, uh, not, not very exciting group. And you can see here the seven characters of this group and the seven um, conjugated classes. And of course, the cyclic groups, they're called cyclic groups and they're the rotational symmetries of engons. And the theorem here is that they're all given, so the simple characters are all given by choosing a root of unity. So Z1 here, as Magma wants to tell us, is actually basically a choice of a seventh primitive root of unity. And you just put here um, the various powers. So Z1, Z1 to the fourth. In this order, it's Z1 to the fourth is the next. Z1 cubed, Z1 to the sixth, Z1 fifth, and Z1 squared. And of course, Z1 to the zero is the first one. And this is how you get all of the simple characters of a cyclic group. Very easy, you just choose a primitive root of unity, and you're good to go. You just you just cycle through all powers. And what happens here is that the group structure is reflected in the multiplication of characters. Right? So whether you think of uh, something like one plus two equals three, 
you could also think of, well, let me give this guy a name here. Let me call it Z, whatever, Z times. So plus is turned into times here. Z squared equals Z cubed, right? So this is what happens here. So multiplication and addition are kind of matched under this uh, correspondence between characters and elements of the group. And you can do really, really just the same for all abelian groups. So all finite abelian groups are just products of cyclic groups. So here, my group would be Z2 cross Z3. And you can easily use that in magma as well. Uh, here's the table that you get. And you will see that the characters, so J, as magma wants to tell us, is a, is a third root of unity. And uh, minus 1 is a second root of unity. Well, minus 1 is a second root of unity. And this table is really just a product of the corresponding tables for Z2 and Z3. And again, the same procedure holds kind of the group structure here is reflected in the multiplication of characters. And that's a really good start to define the dual group exactly how we want it to. Uh, for some historical reasons, the dual group gets a hat symbol instead of a star symbol like the uh, dual vector space. Anyway, so the dual group is defined as all homomorphisms from the group to the complex numbers. You don't want to hit zero, so you take out zero, but otherwise just to the complex numbers. Um, it's stated here a little bit more general than I actually needed. So you can make this for a reasonably locally compact abelian group, whatever. And then you need to some topology and some uh, continuity assumptions. You can ignore that for the finite abelian groups that I have in mind. Uh, but if you like those locally compact abelian groups, here are some further examples of those. Anyway, for finite abelian groups, we take the discrete topology anyway, so there is no topology. In other words, it's just the set of group homomorphisms from G to C star. And just one like catch here depends a bit where you look at the literature. Actually, C star might be replaced by something different. In most circumstances, it doesn't really matter, uh, but in general, it will be slightly different. Anyway, for me, uh, at least in this exposition here, thinking about the dual vector space, C star is certainly a good target. And I should also say that uh, right now I'm restricting to abelian groups to have some nice correspondence because the characters of abelian groups are really one dimensional and this is a correct setup for them. Uh, the characters of non-commutative groups are not one dimensional anymore. Of course you can make this definition, but it might not be the correct one. You would like to have more like a matrix type definition. I'm going to ignore that. I'm staying with abelian groups. So all fine, simple characters are one dimensional. And this is really the group of simple characters. So um, and it's easy to see that pointwise multiplication gives us the structure of an abelian group. So that's what we want. Like the dual vector space should be a vector space. The dual group should be an abelian group. So the dual group of an abelian group should be an abelian group. And it's also finite. I should have said that. It's really the group of simple characters. Right? That's really the group of characters. And as for vector spaces, we get a canonical isomorphism to the double dual, not necessarily to the dual. Remember, for vector spaces, uh, the dual vector space might not be isomorphic to the vector space. For uh, infinite dimensional vector spaces, this is wrong. And like for infinite groups, that's why I'm mentioning those guys here. Also, this is wrong in general. But for finite groups, we have this nice isomorphism like for finite dimensional vector spaces, that actually the dual group, the group of characters, is the same as the group itself, just additively written and multiplicatively written, if you want, exactly in the setup of characters here. That's a dual group. It's pretty nice, like a dual vector space, pretty cool, and in some sense, a pretty straightforward concept. And really, um, the characters are the main players, so the main idea is same picture as before, my Zmod uh, 7, and the map the, so a character has nothing else, so chi1 here. Actually, it's chi2. I should have written chi2. Chi2 sends one to our favorite choice, or my favorite choice here, of a seventh root of unity, uh, of nth root of unity in general. And the isomorphism is just identifying one with uh, this choice of a seventh root of unity, which was exactly my calculation, like z to the one times z to the two squared equals z cubed which matches uh, one plus two equals three. So really it's just kind of a straightforward multi uh, isomorphism which sends addition to multiplication. Anyway, let me wrap up. So uh, at least in my exposition, I hope it makes some sense to think of a dual group as like a version for groups like of the dual vector space and you would like to have kind of the similar properties like a finite dimensional vector space is isomorphic to its dual, uh, a finite group 
should be isomorphic to his dual, and it, it's actually true. Um, slight catch here, you need to use at least finite abelian groups to make things really work. For non-abelian groups, as I said, characters are not one-dimensional anymore, so maybe this is not quite the correct setup. Anyway, for finite abelian groups, it's pretty cool. We hope you liked it, and I also hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.